So, last time we took a look at Metal Gear, while also briefly looking at Snake's Revenge, which is a decent but frustrating game, but not the true sequel fans would have hoped for. Unfortunately, we wouldn't get it in the West until much, much later, but Japan were graced with the subject of today's video. In the previous video, I mentioned that Snake's Revenge was developed without the involvement of Hideo Kojima. However, without it, well, we might not have had any more titles in the series. We might not have had Metal Gear as a series. Kojima ran into one of his former team members on a train ride to Tokyo. His colleague told him of his work on the, now, unofficial sequel. During this meeting, Kojima was encouraged by the same person to work on his own true sequel. And by the time the train arrived at Tokyo, the basic outline for the game was in place. Kojima subsequently pitched it to Konami during a trip to the sales division and... the rest, as they say, is history. But it's pretty crazy to think about, isn't it? You know, talk about a butterfly effect. And the team really wanted to create a better sense of realism this time around, even going as far as to get a former Green Beret involved in various aspects of development, as well as the team taking part in various survival exercises near the workplace. And on the 20th of July, 1990, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake was released. released just two months after Snake's Revenge. Metal Gear 2 sees a PTSD-suffering Solid Snake brought out of retirement by Foxhound to infiltrate the fictional nation of Zanzibar Land. Yes, it's really called that. A nation that has recently seen an uprising from a mercenary unit who, reportedly, have their own Metal Gear in development. Snake is also tasked with the rescue of Dr. Keo Marv, a scientist that recently created a new form of energy known as Oilix, which was developed in response to a recent oil crisis. And yes, it's really called Oilix. Snake once again has the support of a radio team, most notably Colonel Roy Campbell and McDonald Miller, making their first appearances in the series. However, things are never as straightforward as they seem. And, for Solid Snake, it's going to be a very, very long night. The story and script are elements that have been greatly improved upon. There's not only better dialogue between characters communicating via radio, uh, we're not quite at the codex stage yet I'm afraid, but also between characters in person, which just helps the story to slowly unfurl itself more naturally. There's some wonderful twists and turns to boot. We'll get to them much later on though. Even bosses have much more going on. Well. Slightly. For example, most fights will have introductory dialogue where they essentially exposit about who they are and final dialogue before they die. It's an element of the series that saw its introduction here. If I could just quickly go back to that new radio system for a second. With the new radio, there are also character portraits as well. You know, it's not just the face of Solid Snake on the radio screen this time. However, the ones you'll be seeing in this video are vastly different to the original release. And for good reason. Here are the before and afters, and are you noticing any issues? Like, surely you can recognise the likenesses of some of these people, right? All of them, and I do mean all of them, use the likenesses of real people, be it scientists or actors. And all of these were used without permission, so you can probably understand why these were changed in future re-releases. But you know what? I actually quite like the new artwork. It reminds me of the character portraits from Metal Gear Solid Ghost Babel. And you better be sure we're gonna cover that. Metal Gear 2 utilises the power of the MSX2 to create a better looking, better sounding and, overall, better playing game. 
I honestly think this game still looks very good to this day, which is something I honestly admire about the series. They've all aged surprisingly well on the graphical front. With the improved sprites, we also see an improvement in the environments we traverse as well, which means each individual area has its own look and personality. Now, while the game world was competently designed in Metal Gear 1, a lot of areas looked very, very similar, and it could get a smidgen confusing at times, only a little, mind you. But with Metal Gear 2, I never really found myself getting lost at all, and I never really had any issues of forgetting which floor contained a specific locked door that I needed to try opening. There's some copyright protection throughout the game as well, similar to Metal Gear 1. An example of this involves Colonel Roy Campbell's radio frequency changing, with the player being told that a new one is within the game's manual. Metal Gear Solid did something very very similar, which we will get to in the next video. And while gaining Campbell's new frequency isn't necessary to finish the game, two others are. But, like most things, we will cover them very shortly. Anyway, let's, let's just get straight into this, shall we? Instead of approaching from the waters, Snake this time scales the nearby cliffside to begin his infiltration of Zanzibar land, where we quickly discover that we can crawl. I, okay, I know that sounds really silly to be excited about, but it does add a great deal to not only sneaking past enemies, but the overall exploration of the game world itself. There's plenty of holes to hide in, as well as air ducts to traverse, allowing you to collect items and find shortcuts to new and existing areas. It's also useful for bypassing areas such as rooms with steel grating on the floor. You see, if you run across these grates, enemies in the same room will hear your footsteps and then move to your location to investigate. You can also punch nearby walls and objects. With the sound, alert any guards in their vicinity who will then come and investigate. It's a useful tool to distract them and is the first instance of this being used in the series. Oh, sorry, I was just overcome with this feeling of dread. Like, somehow, some way, I'm probably wrong about this. I'm sure someone will tell me. Thankfully, crawling while not as fast as running isn't super slow either, so it doesn't feel like a hindrance overall. And, even better, there's also a radar system. You know, this is already feeling so much more like a Metal Gear Solid experience already. You can see up to nine screens with this bad boy, with enemies, cameras and certain objects showing up as white dots on the radar. Snake and some NPCs will show up as red dots to help distinguish between them. This, just like the crawling mechanic, adds a greater ability to plan out routes and explore locales, so you're less likely to get moments of walking smack bang into an enemy. You can also take a moment to see what their movements will be, or whether they're moving away or towards you. It rewards you for taking your time. Although you can't see which direction they're facing, you can remedy this by using your trusty binoculars. So, we utilise this new gadget and gameplay mechanic to successfully evade the nearby guards and infiltrate the first of the larger buildings Zanzibar Land has to offer. Already, the overall improvements of the game are evident, from better stealth mechanics and enemy AI just being much more forgiving and refined. Here, Snake is contacted by Holly White, a CIA operative that has been sent undercover as a journalist. Getting a lead on Dr. Marv, Snake makes his way to the third floor, zoning in on the Doctor's transmitter. Instead of finding Marv, Snake is attacked by an operative calling himself... <sighs> Black Ninja. Okay, yeah, it's not the most original name, is it? Here, we are introduced to one of those improvements mentioned earlier. The boss characters actually have personality. Well, s some of them. Either way, they do still actually talk, and their little verbal exchanges with Snake is something the series would continue going forward. The boss fights actually feel like boss fights now, complete with a decent bit of music to go with them. Black Ninja is easily enough defeated. All you need to do is just keep moving, avoid his attacks, and pop off a round or two when you have an opening. Nice and simple, really, for the first fight. Once defeated, Black Ninja reveals themselves to be Kyle Schneider? Yes, that Kyle Schneider formerly a member of Snake's support team during the Outer Heaven incident. After the success of Operation Intrude N313, 
NATO launched a bombing raid on what was Outer Heaven, killing refugees, Outer Heaven personnel, even members of the resistance that fought against Big Boss and his band of mercenaries, and even worse, war orphans, before being rescued by him. Schneider intimates that perhaps Big Boss is alive after all, before revealing that Snake can find Dr. Marv by following the Green Beret. Well, that's certainly better than I am shot man because I use shooty shooty shotgun bang bang gun or a uh, cyber cyberoid fucking cyberoids already these characters feel more alive. Sure, there's still some work that could be done, you know, something I feel is completed by Metal Gear Solid 1, but compared to the original, it's leaps and bounds here. This moment with Schneider seems to have a lasting effect on Snake himself, and only furthers his disillusionment with Foxhound and the direction of his life. I've mentioned it already, but I really do like the look of Zanzibar land locations. Each floor of the larger buildings feel different, as well as looking so. Even when there are just slight alterations to the colour palette, there's just much more detail overall helping the game world feel like a real, living, breathing place. Certainly much more so than Outer Heaven. You know what, I completely forgot to mention the rations. Oddly enough, there are different types of rations available, a few of which are essential for completing the game. No, really. The first instance involves these puddles, I'm getting ahead of myself. These puddles of acid that will melt you almost instantaneously. So you basically pour the ration over the pool and it stops Snake from melting, which is which is good. And yes, I'm fully aware how insane that all sounds. The other example? Eh, we'll get there. Anyway, we leave the first building, much earlier than expected, and begin tracking the soldier with the green beret. Making sure not to tip him off, he leads us to a shack in the middle of the jungle. But this must be where Marv is! Oh, no. When you enter this building, where Dr. Marv is believed to be held, you'll instead hear a loud tapping. Well, okay, a loud banging coming from a supposedly hidden room. It's actually a form of code known as the tap code, which is actually a real thing. I looked it up, I was curious. Although that shouldn't be surprising, Hideo Kojima loves putting this stuff in his games. If you're interested, I'd recommend looking up into the history of it. The story behind it is genuinely pretty cool in all honesty. Anyway, the tap code alphabet is also in the game's manual, which means you'd better get a pen and paper ready to figure out what the person next door is trying to tell you. Or just use a walkthrough on the internet. So, what is it? Well, it's Dr. Marv's radio frequency, right? Eh, wrong. We've just been given the number for Dr. Madna? Oh, don't act surprised. Who else do you think designed this new version of Metal Gear? The good doctor does explain himself, though. It seems he was captured shortly after the fall of Outer Heaven as well, and forced to design this improved version of the walking tank. To Snake's surprise, Madnar confirms that the leader of Zanzibar Land is indeed Big Boss. Although, understandably, Snake seems unsure about this. We're given our next lead, however. Dr. Marv is in the building located across the Nariko Desert, although time is of the essence. Marv has a heart condition and will not likely survive the interrogation he will have to endure. Unfortunately, the wall separating Snake and Madnar cannot be destroyed, so... Snake has to leave him, but not before the Doctor gives Snake the contact info for Johan Jakobsen, a zoologist. No, Really, just just wait. And it's very important. Seriously, it's really vital, actually. So, it's time to venture across the singing sand. And why is it called the singing sand? Well, this is why. Basically, it works the same way as the grated floors in the main building, so you'll want to be mainly crawling around here to evade the guards. Luckily though, there are trucks that contain items, but even better, you can just crawl straight underneath them to sneak past your enemies. However, just before then, Snake is stopped when someone informs him that there are mines hidden within the sand, and he'll require a mine detector to... This does seem awfully familiar. Nah, I'm just overthinking it. So, having evaded the mines, guards, and crossing the singing sand, we are approached by. Yeah! I 
I'd prefer if we were ambushed by a tank, if I'm perfectly honest. Not a bloody hind D. So, unfortunately, we need to perform some backtracking and find a weapon that can combat this. Otherwise, Snake will be ripped to shreds in seconds. <laughs> To take down the Hind D, we're going to have to go and grab some Stinger missiles. You heard me. If you're at all familiar with the series, you should understand why this is pretty cool. It's like stumbling across an old friend again. A dangerous and highly explosive friend, but a friend all the same. To acquire this, we need to cross the swamp, or as I like to call it, the Swamp of Frustration, and sometimes, sometimes just... Uh... There's a set path through this bloody thing, and the only way to discover it is to, well, either talk into a nearby child that would give you hints, or by looking it up online. Now, you could go the old trial and error route. If you move off the path, you'll begin to sink and have to slowly stumble back onto safe ground. The only way you'll die is if you purposely just wander off into the swamp. Honestly, it's probably my least favourite part of the game, as it really does feel like more padding and a way to add length to the game, which is something I don't think Metal Gear 2 needs particularly. Honestly, the game length's pretty long for its time, even when you don't factor in the backtracking. And oh boy, we better talk about the backtracking, hadn't we? Oh, you thought Metal Gear Solid was annoying when you had to run all the way back and grab the PSG1, or no, that business with the PAL cards? <laughs> oh, if only you knew. You'll be spending so much bloody time going back and forth between different buildings and areas, and it's not just like popping across the street to a different location. No, you have to navigate some truly tricky location whilst also evading others entirely. There's... honestly, there's just a bit too much of it, and you'll likely find yourself resorting to using a guide because, like the previous game, it, it's not always particularly clear as to where you have to go. It's It kind of leaves it up to your own interpretation sometimes. It does become quite tiresome, honestly. But thankfully, the rest of the game really does make up for it, and I would argue it's almost worth suffering through just for that. So, after the Swamp of Pain has been traversed, Snake encounters the Running Man. Guess what he's good at? Just, just guess. That's right, yeah, he's a world champion dance player. No, of course, he's fast as hell. This absolute git taunts Snake and then proceeds to activate nerve gas within the armory because he's an absolute bastard. I hope you picked up enough mines, though, because that's how he's defeated. This fight is very frustrating. Despite its simplicity, it might take a couple of attempts. Thankfully, Running Man is an idiot and will just run straight into a mine if you shepherd him into them. Okay, I say mines, but you can clearly see here I'm using C4, so, so that works too. Once he dies, the gas is turned off, just like you said. Yeah, not the best one-liner. The armory doors are then opened and... There aren't any Stinger missiles. There are, um... Hmm... There are, there are no, there, there are no, <laughs> there's no, there's no stinger missiles. Where, where are the stinger missiles? Well, luckily, a war orphan just happens to be in there. Maybe he swallowed them or something. And he informs Snake that the missiles, I, I should have known, the missiles were moved to the Zanzibar building so, so that they can be equipped to tanks in the hangar, which makes sense, I suppose, but it does mean we need to backtrack again. <laughs> this isn't. This isn't the last time. After going all the way back to the hangar and then all the way back to the desert, we're ready to take on the Hind D. This fight, while somewhat creative for its time, can be pretty tricky and not in the right way. You need to successfully hit it with four Stinger missiles. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but at this point in the game, you're only able to hold up to six. So if you miss three times, you'll have to traipse all the way back to the main building, again, or you can just purposely get yourself killed like I did. It was definitely the boss I struggled with the most besides Running Man. I mean, I mean, there's always a chance I just suck. But Snake, being the ultimate badass he is, shoots down a Russian gunship and nonchalantly makes his way into the second Zanzi building, where we're told that Holly has had her cover blown and has been in prison. Oh, for God's sake. Oh, she better not be back in that first fucking building again. Oh. 
Oh, okay, no, that's that's fine. I take it all back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I take it all back. I, I just, I guess I jumped the gun a bit. Solid Snake, ladies and gentlemen. Ever the charmer. On the plus side, there's a brand new building to explore full of sexy new locations and new toys to play with. And by play with, I mean used to, to murder people just patrolling. Before being captured, Holly was able to discover a clue regarding Dr. Marv. That of a carrier pigeon. A pigeon, so we, we have to, so we have to catch a pigeon, so we're, we're, are we just, are we, are we just dick dastardly now or something? This is where Jakobsen becomes important because he'll suggest placing down a specific type of ration which will entice the pigeon to land so Snake can grab the little shit. Before reaching the roof, we're accosted by Red Blaster. A Russian grenade expert that comically just crawls around at the top of the screen, throwing grenades at you. I love his little scooch, look at him, he's great. He is defeated by throwing grenades at him, which is ironic, I suppose. He's probably the easiest boss so far. You just need to be patient with him, honestly. Anyway, Snake reaches the roof of the building, coerces the pigeon down. Come on, finger it down. <laughs> oh, isn't she beautiful? The beautiful yeah. plump dove from above, ladies and gentlemen. She's fat. And takes the note attached to it, which turns out to be a radio frequency, and it's Dr. Marv's. Fantastic, we're finally getting somewhere. Now we just need to... Oh, God, he doesn't speak English. Oh, for God's sake. Likely frustrated, Snake contacts Madnar and probably just swears profusely, who suggests tracking down the Czechoslovakian STB agent known as Gustava Hefner, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who was acting as bodyguard for both doctors, which means she will be able to translate, and she... <sighs> guess where, just guess where she is. That's right, she's in the main building. So now we have to go all the way back to the first building, Again, I know, I know, I know you can use the cardboard boxes to travel between buildings a bit quicker, but it's still busy work. Again, it's part of the game I really don't like. I really don't like this. It's really lazy game design. I don't mind the back. I don't listen. Okay, Let, let's just just for real right now. I don't mind backtracking in games. I really don't if it's implemented well into gameplay, such as the vast majority of Soulsborne games. I, I love exploring those locations and backtracking and finding like shortcuts and, and new entrances. However, here I just feel like it's very, very lazy implemented and it always always feels unnecessary. Finding Gustavo won't be that easy, unfortunately, as she's stolen an enemy uniform and is masquerading as... as an enemy guard, and... Um, again, that sounds... that seems really similar. What is it reminding me of? You just need to sneak over to where the bathrooms are, hide, and wait. Then, when Gustavo heads into the ladies' room, you, um... You see, you... Uh, you, um... You, you just... You, you... you follow her in... It's here that Snake actually recognises her. It turns out she's a former Olympic figure skater. Not just that, but a gold medal winning athlete. So, with her help, we determine that not only is Marv safe, but we find out his location! A prison north of the main building. It starts to feel like things might be wrapping up here, as they discover an elevator that leads to Dr. Madnar's holding cell. Awesome! Well, after navigating these machines of death, that is. And I suppose you could argue this is a sewer level, but it's not particularly long, so I'm just not going to count it. Before continuing through the sewers, which we thankfully don't have to sneak around, Dr. Madnar needs to... We need to, you know, visit the little boys' room, which allows some nice character building with Gustafa. And... Yeah, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, really. She was engaged to a man named Frank Hunter, but was refused asylum in the United States and ultimately joined the STB. But before we can find out more, Dr. Madnar comes waddling back. Thanks, Doctor, we were just learning about Gustafa. Thank you very much. Although, it feels as though things are going... too well. And as the group cross the suspension bridge that leads to Dr. Marv, a missile destroys the bridge. <laughs> leaving Snake and Madnar on opposite ends and Gustava fatally wounded. 
where did that missile originate from? Where did it come from? Well, Metal Gear, of course. Which means... That's right, it's already active. And the man piloting it is... Grey Fox. That's right, Foxhound's best agent. A man Snake respected and admired. He is piloting Metal Gear and seemingly leading the forces of Zanzibar Land. Holy shit! This is equal parts shocking and tragic. Shocking as, well, it's Grey Fox. Why is it tragic? Well, we'll soon find out. Before Gustava passes away, she thanks Snake before giving him her brooch. An item that changes into a key when exposed to different temperatures. Okay, hold on. When I streamed this, someone suggested that Metal Gear Solid is bordering on a remake or a better version of Metal Gear 2, and on a very basic level, I suppose so? But there's still enough in Metal Gear Solid that is greatly different from Metal Gear 2. While there are a lot, and I do mean a lot, of similarities between the two games, there's equally enough that is vastly different, such as plot beats, boss fights, and locations. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, you know, it'll all be covered next time. Sorry, I, I got a little off track there. Madnar is taken away by armed guards. Grey Fox demands that Snake leaves Zanzibar land or be killed. But we all know that's just gonna spur Snake on. I'm certain that Fox knows that. But how are we gonna cross the crevasse? The bridge is gone. Well, we need to... Head back to a previous building. Where we can acquire a glider so we can glide across the now destroyed bridge. It's easy peasy, right? This is a part of the game I quite like, actually. No, really, I, I'm not joking. There's plot and dialogue for sure, but there's also a long stretch here that allows you to just explore the facilities, especially with the abundance of cards we have by this point. Which brings me to something else I really like. Remember how I bitched about the card situation in Metal Gear 1? Well, in this game, you can find these master keys that are color-coded and are awesome. Why? Well, as you'll see, the red card will open any doors requiring levels 1 to 3, which means you'll be spending less time trying dozens of cards on one door. It's a small thing, but it's a small thing I deeply appreciate. However, Metal Gear Solid would perfect this. Taking out the four horsemen units in another scene that would be lifted and placed directly into Metal Gear Solid, who are an elite squad made up of members of the SAS, GSG-9 and UDT, Jungle Evil, a former member of the South African Special Forces who specializes in ambush techniques, and Night Fright, an assassin that uses optical camouflage making him undetectable to the naked eye and Snake's radar. And while it seems like I'm skimming through these fights, don't misunderstand me. They're all pretty fun challenges in their own right, giving the player further, further difficulty whilst also showcasing just how good Solid Snake is as an operative and how quickly he can adapt to different situations. He outright destroys the Four Horsemen unit, despite them getting the drop on him in a confined space. Jungle Evil, despite having an advantage due to the location, is easily dispatched. And, more impressively, Night Fright, who cannot be seen, is brought down after Snake uses his keen sense of hearing. Sometimes it's just the little things, you know? Snake eventually makes it to Dr. Marv's cell. Finally! I mean, we don't speak his language, but I mean, that shouldn't be like, too much of a problem, right? I'm sure you'll know how it is. Oh. Oh, shit. We were too late. No joke, but this felt like a punch to the stomach when I first played this. First, we fail to help Dr. Madnar and Gustava, with the latter dying in front of us, but now we've also failed to save Dr. Marv, one of the main objectives of this mission. I mean, it's not a complete loss. Dr. Madnar was placed in the same cell, informing Snake that Marv's body just couldn't withstand the torture. But there's still a chance to retrieve the Oilix formula. Gustavo's brooch is actually a key to the storage locker, but it needs to be subjected to cold temperatures so that it will change shape into a key. So, guess where we need to go? Go on, just get to... Guess, back to building... One! It's not so bad this time, as we get to stow away on one of the trucks that's travelling to and from locations. Just make sure you don't get in the wrong one. But before we get a chance to leave, Holly contacts Snake to give him some... troubling information. Madnar was never captured by Sansibar Land Forces. He came here willingly to oversee development of Metal Gear. 
But that can't be right. If that was the case, then why was Madna imprisoned? It doesn't make any sense, but I mean, Holly seems trustworthy. Why should she lie to us? Someone is lying here, and wanting answers, Snake confronts Madna directly. Unfortunately, Holly has proven right. Worse still, Madna killed Marv accidentally, and it was his tip-off to Grey Fox that led to the death of Gustavo Hefner by making contact with him whilst in the sewers. Madnar then leaps onto Snake's back and starts to strangle him. Look at the stones on this guy! So for some reason, I don't, I mean, I don't understand this, but the highly trained special operative has trouble shaking off this aging, podgy scientist. Instead of just judo throwing his ass, he decides instead to shake him off via the use of gas grenades. It's easy to scoff, to take this fight lightly, and I, I can make silly jokes about it, but you cannot shake him off. And do you have to defeat him quickly, or you're gonna end up going through all your rations, and you will die. I mean, I, I suppose I could have used a remote-controlled missile and shoved it so far up his backside he would have been able to tell the brand, but I like Snake as he is, and not in a million little pieces. Basically, what I'm saying you should do is PANIC! Having murdered Dr. Madnar, the bastard, and returning to Building 1 by evading the patrolling goons and hanging around the freezer until the brooch changes, Snake returns to Marv's cell and uses the key to open the locker, which is HUGE inside! Look at the size of this! But before he can grab the Oilix formula, he must rid himself of the dreaded, venomous Zanzibar hamster! <laughs> and you thought the future games got weird. Do you remember earlier in the video I mentioned one of the ration types that were essential for completing the game? Well, this is the moment I was talking about. Don't worry about figuring out which one though, you just need to call up Jakobsen, who informs Snake that the venomous hamsters are quite partial to the B3 rations. You'd better hope you still have some, otherwise you'll need to start looking for more or murdering guards until they drop some tasty goodness. Anyway, we finally acquire the Oilix formula, which is stored on an MSX cartridge. Oh, Kojima. As Snake begins to leave, however, seemingly out of guilt for his actions and realising he would be unable to attend the wedding of his daughter, Ellen, Madnar reveals Metal Gear D's weakness, its legs, its- <laughs> wait, oh wait. Its legs. ITS LEGS?! The weakness of a nuclear-equipped walking battle tank is its legs. I mean, this has to be because it's actually not finished, right? But if, honestly, if I'm creating a walking tank, a walking tank, you know, something that has legs, I'm going to make sure the legs are finished! FINISH THE LEGS! When Madnar concludes his final words, Snake falls through a trap door and hears none other than Grey Fox himself. He also challenges Snake to fight him in an adjacent room. Thankfully, the door to the south contains some ammunition and rations in case we're running low, and they will be needed. And it's a nice touch as well, since this is essentially the final stretch of the game. Also, Grey Fox has reason to be confident, because he is once again piloting Metal Gear. Snake enters the room, and once more takes on the walking tank. <laughs> You know, I really like the introduction of Metal Gear here. Earlier in the game, we'd only seen the feet of this bipedal tank during the death of Gustava, and we'd seen little snippets of it during the intro as well. And it certainly beats the version in the previous game where it was just sat in a room static. Here, it looms into view, like a creature of legend, intimidating. And Snake, well, Snake stands there, taking it all in unwavering, determined. This is a really decent boss fight in all honesty, and it's much better than the fight with Metal Gear in Metal Gear 1. And it's one of the toughest in the games as well. Metal Gear D is defeated simply enough, however. You just keep your head, keep moving, and toss grenades at its legs when you have an opening, and you'll bring the walking tank down to your level in no time, but do not get impatient. <laughs> It's not over yet, though. 
The resulting explosion engulfs the area, striking Snake and forcing him to remove his equipment, all of his equipment, allowing Grey Fox to snatch the Oilix formula in the chaos. With all of his weapons gone, Snake finds himself trapped in a minefield face to face with Grey Fox. It's at this moment that a member of our support team, George Kasler, makes contact to reveal that Grey Fox is in fact Frank Hunter, meaning he killed the woman he loved the person he was engaged to marry. The question is, did he even know Gustavo was there? Did he unknowingly kill her? I imagine a few people have tried to convince themselves that it was a mistake, like some kind of tragic twist, if you will. I would argue that he did know. Madnar was working with the mercenaries this entire time, so there's every chance he would pass on all of this information to them. Grey Fox is a soldier and he is full of hatred. This man would die for the person in command of Zanzibar land. There is no doubt in my mind he was fully aware that Gustavo was on that bridge. If he'd not yet passed the point of no return, then this act was it. When defeated, he admits to Snake that war was all he knew. Being a soldier was all he was good at, and he needed it. He only felt alive on the battlefield. Big Boss had saved him countless times. So I absolutely believe that he'd follow him here to Zanzibar land. How could he not? Grey Fox reveals himself to be our number one fan. Perhaps part of him wanted Snake to succeed, or to have a chance to face him? Maybe one on one? Maybe he went to face off against Snake and see who was the better man, the better soldier, the better fighter. Despite everything, Snake still reassures him that Gustavo will be waiting for him on the other side, to give him some peace before the end. Why? Grey Fox is the bad guy. Well, I believe there are a few reasons here. First and foremost, Grey Fox was a soldier Snake greatly admired and would have considered a friend. A man transformed by the horrors of war and the events he had witnessed. Secondly, Grey Fox is almost like a reflection of Snake, one of many, showing the dark path he could very easily find himself traversing. This is another pivotal moment for the character, who could have so easily given in to hatred and vengeance. And more importantly, as we've already seen, Kojima clearly wanted to make these characters feel more real and human. Not just stereotypical lunatics that want to rule the world, or just, you know, generic cookie cutter bad guys. These are people that have motives and see this as the only solution. What would boasting do for Snake in this situation? Nothing, and he knows this. However, one final reflection of Solid Snake awaits just ahead. Wait, oh sorry, hang on, hang on. I didn't even talk about the battle, did I? The boss fight with Grey Fox is great in its simplicity, which is absolutely a positive as, quite frankly, it's an afterthought compared to the passing of Grey Fox and the character building that follows. And as the dust settles on the recent battle, a familiar voice taunts Snake. Following that voice, we discover that Big Boss is indeed alive and well. You get the sense that Solid Snake always knew in the pit of his stomach that his former superior was alive, that he'd survived the events of Outer Heaven. As he quickly states he took the mission to get rid of the nightmares that have surfaced because of that operation. Big Boss boasts that he has given Snake a place in this world as a soldier, explaining his logic further, start a war, fan its flames, and create victims, then save them, train them and feed them back into the battlefield. Further implying that Snake has only one purpose, to fight on the field of battle, believing both never truly feel alive unless in combat. Along with the death of Grey Fox, this is another major turning point in the character of Solid Snake. There's one thing I should mention very quickly before we move on. There's a massive retcon in Metal Gear Solid involving this confrontation in particular. It's a retcon that does work, but I don't really think I should speak about it until we cover Metal Gear Solid. Sorry. Despite the attempted mind games from Big Boss, well, it's all feeling a little special, isn't it? It's got like a big fight feel to this. This dialogue really helps build up the final battle of the game. But what can we do? Snake has lost all of his weaponry and equipment during the fight with Grey Fox, and Big Boss has some big old fucking rifle. Well, we're just gonna have to improvise, and that's exactly what Snake does. You need to evade Big Boss at all costs, 
there's absolutely no way you can rush him and attempt to take him down hand to hand. We have to also navigate more puddles of acid. Having found various keys to open specific rooms, we're able to fashion a makeshift flamethrower as we literally burn Big Boss alive. And that is a really nasty way to go. Honestly, what was the alternative? Big Boss was beyond saving at this point, almost like a, a parody of himself. And the once fabled hero who has been transformed into a war-mongering monster, the type of person he once fought against, he had to go. But there's no time to ponder on this. Snake and Holly need to escape the facility and rendezvous with their extraction team. What the hell, Holly? Listen, Snake's intestines are already knackered due to the vast amounts of rations he's been eating. I don't think he needs you to attempt to literally scare the shit out of him. This section isn't as simple as the original. Here, we need to move as quickly as possible whilst also gunning down the guards in hot pursuit. For its time and the limitations, it's a pretty fun and exciting little section. When Holly and Snake arrive, there's, there's no helicopter. But it's a gotcha moment as Charlie swiftly arrives and guns the soldiers down, picks up Holly and Snake, and then leaves the area. Snake and Holly sit back with a sigh of relief, but not before Colonel Campbell offers Snake a chance to return to Foxhound. Snake, of course, turns this down. It is then confirmed that the MSX cartridge does indeed have the Oilix formula, as Dr. Marv signed it in reverse and- Wait. Oh, that's what- that's what the- that's what VRAM was? The- the- the, the boot up screen, the start of the game, look! Oh, Kojima. Snake, ever the bastard, completely blows off Holly's proposals to have Christmas dinner together, and then retreats into the Alaskan wilderness to find peace. Well, whatever peace he can find. I know that this may have seemed more like a synopsis at times, but honestly, these first few entries in the series, while good, don't resonate with me as much as the others. The first entry I played was Metal Gear Solid, with each sequel being a day one purchase for me. Except for Portable Ops and Peace Walker, because I just didn't have the means to play them. And they all have that special place in my heart. And taking that into consideration, this is a pretty damn good game. There's a lot more polish this time, and it really seems as though Kojima and his team learnt from their previous experience to create a well-rounded and great stealth adventure, although it is still tough as nails and not without its own frustrations. One of the more frustrating aspects of the game is definitely the backtracking, as I've bitched about incessantly. Uh, you thought Silent Hill for the Room had backtracking issues? <laughs> no. But there's so much going on plot-wise this time around, and when I say more, I mean it. In comparison to the rest of the series, the plot of Metal Gear 1 is the most simplistic. And while it probably was good for its time, Metal Gear 2 just blows it out of the water. The jump in terms of quality of writing is incredible. It's still very schlocky in places, but the improvement is absolutely admirable. In particular, character development. The large majority of these characters are just so much more fleshed out, with most villains having backstories that allow you to understand their motives, yet still disagree with what they're doing, even if you understand. They're not just stereotypically evil. There are war orphans here. Children. They were rescued after the Outer Heaven incident. It does lead to conflicting feelings. It really helps place you in the shoes of Snake even more. Speaking of which, Solid Snake is much more complex this time around and feels more akin to the Snake we all know and love in Metal Gear Solid. He's not quite there yet, but you get the sense he's becoming completely disillusioned by his life as a Foxhound operative, and that cynical side is beginning to take control. So, how did the game score back in the day? 
Well, I had a bit of trouble tracking that information down, unfortunately, but it definitely sold well, as it was on MSX Magazine's top 30 selling games for six months, making it to first place in October of 1990, and is highly regarded to this day, usually scoring rather high with modern critics. It's still really good, and honestly, it's such a shame we never received Metal Gear 2 until much, much later. The NES port of the first game, despite being an inferior version, sold well and it's genuinely surprising that this wasn't ported to any 16-bit consoles. Could you imagine this on either the, the Mega Drive, the Super Nintendo, or hell, even the TurboGrafx-16? It would have blown me away as a kid. Then again... You know, I wonder if it had have been ported, would Metal Gear Solid have had such an impact on me? That's a stupid question. Of course it would. These original MSX games are still really fun to play through, despite those issues I have with them. Sure, there are some frustrating moments and irritating cryptic bollocks, you know, gaining the officer uniform Metal Gear 1 springs instantly to mind, but they don't come close to outweighing the positives. If you are a fan of the series and you haven't played either of them, then you absolutely owe it to yourself to do so. Like I said before, there are plenty of ways to do this. Buy an old copy of Subsistence on PS2, or nab either the HD or Legacy Collection. And with the imminent release of the new Metal Gear Solid Collections, to coincide with the release of Metal Gear Delta, and you better be sure I'm excited for that. It's going to be even easier to play these older titles. But if you don't want to play both of them, absolutely go with Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. It does everything a good sequel should do. It builds upon the original and improves not only the gameplay, but every other aspect as well. It's a damn good game and a great sequel. And with that trip into the history of the series completed, join me next time as we'll be covering the game that not only properly introduced the series to myself and the West, but introduced most of us to Hideo Kojima himself. The classic, the brilliant Metal Gear Solid. You know what? I cannot wait. Oh god, well that's part two out of the way, and now I can be moving on to the games I actually grew up with. If you enjoyed the video, then please do check out my other videos, as I'll be adding more content to the channel in between producing this series, which takes a lot of effort and time, because I can't work on that often. And don't forget to follow me on Twitch, as I'll inevitably be screaming like a child at something spooky. But until then, stay safe, and I'll catch all of you later. Oh boy, it's hot.